What is up, Wizards fans? Welcome to another Believe in Wizards podcast. We're back after a little break here. Honestly, the Wizards need a break from us. We need a little break from them. We've still been watching, so we'll catch you up on where we're at. Uh, but first of all, before we get going, Jihadi, how's things? How's life? How are you? Oh, life's good, man. Life's good. Just enjoying it. You know, doing a little traveling. Basketball, high school basketball season is finally over, so I get a little bit Breathe of life for myself, and I'm taking it. Yeah, I don't blame you. Uh, I've been following on Instagram there. It looks like some good trips, so uh, I'm, I'm a little jealous, but I don't blame you. Uh, before we get going, let's just knock out our ad reads. Brought to you by Stateside Vodka and their Surfside Hard Ice Teas, our lemonades, our half and halves. They're all delicious. And Bet Online. It's your number one source for all your betting needs. Get the latest odds, lines, and match reports for baseball, boxing, golf, UFC, women's March Madness, men's March Madness, NBA, whatever you want to bet on. Probably have bet on the G League playoffs. Uh, we'll get to that here in a little bit. Probably smart to always bet against a Wizards team uh, at any level, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, but yeah, go to the website, use your mobile device, and use our promo code BLEAV, B-L-E-A-V, for 50% off welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. All right, so we're we're limping our way to the finish line here of the NBA season. The Wizards are 15 and 62, which has just kind of punched me in the stomach to say that out loud. They're coming off a, a split between the Bucks and Lakers. Overall, not too bad. Uh, I guess just just anything you've seen lately, Jihadi, that's worth talking about. Uh, I, I got a couple things for you here, but just want to give you kind of a first opportunity to react to, to anything you've seen on the court so far. Tristan. Tristan Vucevic. Yeah, that's that's where I would have um, gone to, I think. That's a good call. I'm glad to see we have a type of player like he is, and we don't we really don't even know the type of player he is yet. Sure. Because every every time I watch him, I see something, something else that that how far his game has actually expanded, what he can do. You know, he's not a one-dimensional player, mm -hmm. not a typical big. He's not a typical three-point shooter. He's not a typical facilitator. Yeah. Right. Um, rebounder, not bad. But what I like to see is that we get a player like that at this time in the season. Reason That's being cool. is. The pressure is off of him. He's still pressured to show show up and, and sure. prove. But all of the pressure that came throughout the season, the up and down, the adversity, the the things that can affect the players' play, can affect the players' mental, hmm. can affect the players' drive, he bypassed all of that. Right yeah, now, cool. almost in the season to where – you don't really have to. Everybody can just jail and play because you're not playing for anything. Mm -hmm. So now you're getting to see more freer players, more intense players, right. um, more players being able to be naturally just playing their game. Mm -hmm. He gets to come during that time and really fill in well. Not only fill in well, but make a, a, a surprising impact. Mm-hmm. The passing is the piece that I didn't see at all when I watched sort of pre-draft tape. He's thrown a couple like really savvy passes, but also one, he's not afraid to shoot it if he gets a good look. But if he doesn't, he also makes the right pass. And that's sort of more of that European upbringing, I think. And what you talked about early in the year with Kulabali and we've seen it with Denny, like the ball movement with them on the court together is really good. And having more of those kind of players out on the court, I, I think is only going to serve you in the, the long run here. I think Denny and Kisper really both work well with him. He's yeah. not he's not noticing the open player. Mm -hmm. He's noticing where the open player can be. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so he's, he's more advanced than just a regular facilitator. That's why I say he's just not a facilitator. Mm -hmm. Right. He's noticing a guy. Okay. I see. If I catch it here, I know uh, Denny is about to cut. Or Corey's yeah. about to cut. All right. Okay. So if he cuts. If he cuts too short, then that pass is going to get taken. So I'm going to mm -hmm. pass it to where he has an extended cut, and now he has to go get it. Now he's right there with it. He's setting you up for mm -hmm. easy money. Yeah, he had right. one to Corey that, like, fed him right to the hoop. Uh, and, like, all Corey had oh, to do was, man. like, scoop it. I'm telling you, man, like, these European players, I, I hate to say it. <laughs> hey, they make – it's hard to not want the game to go, the NBA game to go to how they're playing. Yeah, it's more fun to watch. It's fun. It's fun to watch. It's more. It's more team ball. Mm -hmm. It's more. It's less selfish. 
but it's also like, oh, why, why, why don't we try? Why don't we teach that to our players? Why yeah, don't we say true. pass to the spot where you want him to go into the spot where instead of the spot that, where he's going to be, right? Yeah. Now, as a cutter, I'm gonna have to change my cuts a little bit. I may mm-hmm. have to slow him down, speed him up. I may have to have an extended cut, mm-hmm. but that's another player teaching you that, right? And mm-hmm. and what it is is just making your game. What it does is make it it opens up the floor. It makes everybody's game easier. It makes everybody able to score easier. So now when I have to go into my bag of just everything I do not normally, I already got like ten points. And, and I think the more continuity they all have together, the better that's going to look, too. I mean, this is in like, we're just throwing you all together and they're kind of like figuring it out and trying to do the right things. And it's just working out like once you've got a real sense for who can be where, who can get what passes, who likes the ball where it just gets, uh, you know, it gets a lot easier, I think, too. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, right. Just on the European basketball and, and their players, like somebody's got to tell our guy Gilbert Arenas about that. Uh, I don't know if you saw this one. Honey, right, but, uh, today, but MVP? Yeah, come on, man. It's just such a stupid take. I I, I love the man, but just we, we got to – he hates European basketball players so much. There's no, – like does. he was killing Giannis. He was just the week before the Kenyon Martin saying how much better Kyrie is than Luca and Gilbert agreeing with him. I was just like, we're, we're now killing the two-time MVP because statistics? Like, oh, that was a tough listen. In the end of the day, the MVP is the best player that year. Yeah, right. I'm the end. I mean, who you can't, who's in denial that Yoke is the best player that year? To me, the only other com- person that you could really say, okay, that he may be getting cheated a little bit is Jason Tatum. Tatum's getting a little underrated, I think. Overall. Yeah, like he's and Bede was. You know, had an argument one of those two years. He had a really big argument. Yeah. You know, Giannis maybe had an argument one of those two years. But these are guys that are all in the discussion. It's not like you you know propping Jokic up over like uh, prime Kareem Abdul Jabbar or something. It's just Jokic. Jokic is making the biggest impact. Yeah. But also, he's making the biggest impact in a unicorn type of sense. Mm-hmm. Right. That's why. Yeah, that's why up? he's so impressive. That's why he's an MVP. Right. Because he's doing amazing things that he's defying the odds of the game. Mm-hmm. You know, how it's played, how, you know, with not very much, I mean, just like Luca, with not very much athletic ability. Yeah. Yeah. He just makes it work. He's got good pace, got good, you know, pace. body control. Uh, like all those things are huge and he underrated. Can, he, can see, he can see the entire court, he can see behind his head. Yeah. He shoots crazy shots at the at the buzzer that you look that looked like that's awkward that mm-hmm. definitely shouldn't look like they go in, but he done it so many times you know it's something that he works on is actually something he does. So when you see in when you when you're used to the NBA game being one way, yeah, it's hard to and change. And the player comes and just defy all the odds, it completely flips it on his head. Mm-hmm. You have to pay attention to it. Not not only when he does that, he's successful at it. He's a he's a big that's six, what almost what seven foot? Yeah, I think he's seven footer. Yeah. He's dribbling, Around he's that. running point. Everything flows through him. He it's can't block a shot. Yeah. Big block a shot, strong. I mean powerful. Oh, Name me another guy. I haven't seen a guy like Jokic since the bonus. And yeah, I'm talking about right. the, 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 the dad, yeah. senior. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. It, and if the bonus played in this time where the game has advanced, his game would be – would naturally have to advance to the version of how Jokic is playing now. Yeah, I think so too. But I, that's the only other player that I ever think that could do what Jokic could do. Yeah, at that size, I it just you, you don't see that combination of things very often. And I think good players they can adapt their game to any pace the game is being played at. The great players make everyone else play at their pace, and I think True. that's what you see Jokic do. Yeah. Uh, all right, that's that's one European player taken in the second round during a Taco Bell commercial. Let's go back to our European player taken in the second round. Uh, 
with Vucevic, um, Noel in the chat asked, "How good can Vucevic, uh, Vucevic be? Let be like, what's the what's the ceiling for a player like that?" He doesn't have one because what right now? What, what is he? Nineteen? No, I think 20? yeah, twenty something like that. So, so just imagine how young he is and how advanced he is mm-hmm. now, yeah. right? So, but we also understand that he's already been a pro. Right. Yeah, understand, he's a little he's there. understand how comfortable he is, he is out there. Mm-hmm. Like when he's playing, it doesn't seem like his first NBA game or yeah. second NBA. Even the way he he reacts to reacts to a made shot or reacts to um something well he does. He's already doing the gestures and everything. Mm-hmm. Right. Most play, most players that just came in their second, second, mm-hmm. third, fourth day on the Still team. learning all that. Well, they're too or too shy to do it still. Too shy to do it and, and, and not not sure if they should do it or not. Mm-hmm. Right? They had to learn a team, whether well, maybe GM don't like me, you know, going through right. all the things. That's, what's the vibe here? Yeah. Yeah, what's the vibe trying to fill it out? All of that's gone. He's playing his game. Mm-hmm. He's um enjoying himself. And he's pretty much when he's out there, he's a pretty much leading our offense because everything is pretty much going through him because he's seeing so many things. Yeah, I mean, it's it's still like a small sample size, but I've liked what we've seen on that end. Uh, the problem is in that equally small sample size, I have not liked what we've seen on the other end. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He, he looks real slow to me, and him trying to block shots, I've seen a couple where he's been totally flat-footed, like both heels on the ground trying to block someone else's shot, and I get like trying to be vertical and stuff, but if you're trying to like weak side shot block without jumping, I just, I don't, I really don't know what the point is at this point. I've seen him jump for a few block shots where mm-hmm. I noticed he can't get off the ground. Okay. That's cool. right. He didn't get him. Yeah, he, right. but his he... timing was off, but he was off mm-hmm. the ground. Okay. That's good. Um, he doesn't really want to be too physical mm-hmm. defensively, but I think that's the part of the game where you going every night, you're going to have to face some monsters. Sure. All right. You're facing monsters every night. You're going to have to adjust no matter what. These aren't the same type of players you are to mm-hmm. where they can, you know, stretch the floor. So yeah. with a Giannis or with a KD, you're going to have to stretch. Stay, you're going to have to stand, stand your ground. Yeah. At least make them work and for it a little. Yeah. So, I'm not sure if he's played against players like that yet. No, probably not. I'm not not many he, at he's least. He's young enough to where he can grow into that part. So yeah. I think the ceiling. I think the ceiling is very high for him. It, yeah. Just seeing him now, you you know, I'm I'm surprised the Wizards didn't bring him over earlier. I'm glad yeah. they didn't. But you know, it's. It's kind of weird to see a, a player like like him just sit, sitting around. Yeah, We're show not sitting up at the around, end but not here. Right. The, the other challenge with that too is uh, it's been kind of reported that based on how they brought him over and the structure of the contract coming at this point in the season, they'll probably have to renegotiate his sort of real deal with him this off season. And now he's looking really good. You may have just cost yourself some long term money by by waiting to do it this way. So. I don't really love that move from the Wizards, although at this point in their rebuild, they may not even care about a couple of million dollars here or there for someone like Vucevic. So, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Maybe they'll say it's not enough sample size to factor into the into the logic of the the trade dem- or the contract demands here, but not the I, I, savviest I like move in my opinion. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's probably one of the smartest way. And in, 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 in that case, it's... You know, you 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 expect differently from the new the new organization that we have. Like, you know, people up top. Sure. But uh, it happens. I don't think they expected to get what they got either. Yeah, probably. You're probably right. Nobody thought he was going to come over and put up 15 points. You know, in his second yeah. or second start or his first real they start. to get that. You know, um, and then with it, I like the Bagley, the one two with him and Bagley, especially mm-hmm. Bagley as a backup to him. Yeah. That's not bad. Um. I still don't know how I feel about uh, giving away Gafford. Yeah. Because I don't know if Gafford would have been a better one two with him or Bagley. You know, I think that if you had Gafford as a – now him and Gafford on the floor together would really be a good move. 
If yeah, they you're if, stretching the floor a little bit and get yeah, some space. To me, if you could, before floor. you would have, before you got rid of Gafford, if it, that should have been something that you could have brought him over and tested out. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I'm with you. The, the Bagley one is tough because he's been pretty good when he's played. It's just the same kind of things popping up. Can't stay on the floor again. It's meant more Rashawn Holmes than I think they probably would have liked. And he's been yeah. fine. Like if he's your third big guy, I don't really actually have a problem with that. Yeah. But, you know, it's he's not a real needle mover. Let's put it that way, at least. Um, for, for anybody that hasn't seen it, Buksevich, first career start uh, last night against the Lakers. 15 points, 5 of 9 shooting, 3 of 6 from 3, 3 rebounds, 1 assist, 1 block. And the game before that against Milwaukee, he had 14 points, seven rebounds, three assists, and played 31 minutes. The 31 minutes is my favorite of all those really good stats. And to be honest with you, every time I see someone like Anthony Gill on the court at this point in the season, it fills me with rage. It's not a personal attack on Anthony Gill. It's just he doesn't need to be getting 26 minutes at this point in the year. Like, just play literally everyone under age 25. Like, Patrick Baldwin should get every Anthony Gill moment you know, minute and you figure out what you have in these young guys. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, because I mean, honestly, honestly, Anthony Gill is, I like, I like his energy. Yeah. I like his energy. I like, mm-hmm. um, that's about it. I can give you right yeah. now. I like his energy. I like yeah. his energy. I like how, I like his leadership. I like the way he talks. I like the way he, he, he helps the players out. But I don't mm-hmm. see him moving any neither. No. I don't see if him he's... doing one thing in pack other than running the floor, <laughs> which makes which makes a player his size have to run to, right? Um, but you know, those those minutes should go to the ball win and the guys that you can really test out. Uh, yeah, it's just I mean, if it, you had done it, Gil's game... not going to get get you and get no work himself into a big, bigger, better contract. Yeah. If anything, his career is on the way down at this point. I'm not, yeah. I say this as a 35 year old, but as a 30 year old, he's, he's hit the peak of his, his powers probably at this point. Whereas yeah. Champagne or any of these other guys, even Amarui, like it, it's though, there's still more to see if you can see, if you can scale him up. Okay. He played eight minutes. Can he play 15? Okay. Play 15. Can he play 20? And then you go in the next year with sort of like a full accounting, you know, of what each of these guys can kind of give you and, or at least a better accounting. And and with him, it's, there's nothing Gil is going to show you that you haven't already seen. And he's not making anyone else's lives easier. So it's not like you're getting a better evaluation by playing him out there next to some of these younger guys. It just, I just don't really get the logic behind it. I don't know if it's, it's, it's his experience or is it because he's a bigger body or because he's a, he's active, mm-hmm. but, uh, Probably a little bit of both. I I think Gil is good being out there for Vucevic. Reason being is he's helping Vucevic through all the play series at that Mm -hmm. moment, right? An assistant coach on the floor, basically. Yeah, so other than that, that's probably I see a need for Gil to be out there. Mm -hmm. Also, Vucevic is not the best rebounder. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, you probably need a bigger rebounding tandem. Mm-hmm. Uh, when when Kuzma's not in the game, makes sense. But uh, yeah, like like you said, he's at, he's pretty much at at his peak at thirty years old. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Wiggs Gaming asked us, should we draft a center? Uh, he said, not named Alex Sar, based off Tristan's play. If Sar isn't available, I'd argue we should give the reins to Vucevic. He looks so comfortable offensively. He just needs to learn to defend without fouling. So I, I guess just simplifying the question here a little bit, would what you've seen from Vucevic impact your drafting strategy at all in any way? Yes and no. Okay. Reason being is right now, Vucevic to me, you can make him into a poor man's poor Zingas. Like that. Right, but with mm-hmm. more facilitating, more facilitator uh, qualities, which means you're still going to need a big body out there with him. Sure. Right. So Kuzma is a big body that can rebound. Yeah, um, Denny can a little bit for you too. Denny can a little bit, but you need a body who can absorb some impact and, and give some impact. Yeah, and you keep so, going more on the perimeter. Yeah. Right. 
But you need an active body who can move, can slash, can slash downhill. Mm-hmm. Reason being is is after looking at him, the Wizards when when it's five out and that floor is spread, mm-hmm. they're very they look very good. Yeah. So you want to be able to draw whoever big that you're playing against that day out. Mm-hmm. So you can't bring another big that plays inside, another big body that plays inside. It has to be a guy who can be a good slasher. It's comfortable being in the perimeter, but also can be an anger for defense that can rebound. Mm-hmm. So, yes, yes, and yes, I think you still go get another big body, but you don't get it um, to back up Vucevic or, or play in front of him. You yeah. get it to play alongside him. And I think just you just take talented guys at this point. If the next guy up on your board is a big, you take him and you figure that shit out later. We're years away from needing to figure out, you know, like the who is on the final roster by the time we're good again. I, I think that's um, that'd be a nice right. problem to have, but you need all the talent you can get here. Uh, the other thing with Vukovic too, it's, I, it's honestly, it's been since Porzingis. Like I, I guess a Gallinari and Mascala you know, did a little bit in the year, but you haven't really had like a stretch big that could play real minutes uh, this season. And I think that's actually impacted pool a little bit because you've seen him be able to get like some easier shots the last couple games. Like when he's dancing, he's actually like kind of getting somewhere a little bit more now because people can't cheat off of Bagley or cheat off of Gafford or cheat off of Holmes. Like if you've got Vucevic who could shoot it in a corner, You've created just that little bit of extra space, and then Poole can sort of drive and kick if the defender can't cheat quite as much. Um, he's getting guys more on their heels, and it's lead to like slightly better shots for him. I, I'm still, I don't think I'll ever be a, a fan of the Jordan Poole in Washington experience personally, but I've seen a few things um, that that make me think that maybe that's a help for him is to just if he can't naturally create that space for himself, like at least maybe the other guys can. I didn't think that I could be a Jordan Poole in Washington fan either because I didn't think he – I thought he was too stubborn-headed to be mm-hmm. able to accept change or try to make a change mm-hmm. or try to be a more poised player. Yeah. But these last two games, I like the pool I'm seeing. I like that he's taking time. He's. It seems like he's realizing the more I give up the ball, mm-hmm. the more I get it. And when I get it, I'm in better positions, right? I'm not going to shoot a quick rush step back sh- shot. Sure. I'm going to shoot a wide open shot, mm-hmm. right? And re- the way that I'm realizing I'm getting wide open shots, which those are on, those are the ones I'm hitting. Yep. And he's hitting them consistently, doing a good job. Is because now you have to respect every other player. So let me make let me learn how to make this the team respect every other player. Mm-hmm. Now I'm getting easy, wide open things. That's just the same way. Like remember when I said that that Vucevic is given pretty much giving certain players ten points before they even play their game. Yeah, that's one of them. Well, that's what's that's the same thing that's happening to Poole by him facilitating getting everybody open getting everybody involved mm-hmm. now he's giving himself 10 points easy before he has to really even go into his back yep so i like this pool that i'm seeing lately he's he's more poised he's he's more i see him and i didn't realize he can really see the court like he can he's made a lot more like actual like play he, he's created plays for other guys and and now there's still a lot of creating place for the wrong team too with some of the turnovers, but he's actually like, I I can live with the turnovers if you're actually, you know, affecting a defense enough to like spoon feed a few easy baskets for other guys. Like, and and to your point, like we didn't see much of that early in the year. I don't think. Yeah. Also on defense, he's playing the passing lanes a lot more. So he's creating a lot of turnovers for the other team. I'll be honest, I just turn away whenever he's guarding the ball, especially. Off ball, like, not as bad, but on ball, it's like, all right, just just do what you're going to do. We got to watch it, man. We got to pay attention. <laughs> uh, he, him, him on defense is tough for me. I just, uh, it I, just drives you crazy. It, it, yeah, it just, there are just certain things. And I, he's like a multi-year pro at this point. 
but he just seems like he would benefit from time in the weight room more than just about anybody I think I've seen in the last couple of years. Like guys just move him so easily. Yeah. And I don't know if that's an effort thing or just doesn't have the physical strength to do it. But I think it's an excuse thing. Yeah, could be. Right. Like the excuse is, well, he moved, well, get over it. Well, he moved me all the way. He made, like that's <laughs> right. a person who li- literally only likes one side of the court. Mm hmm will have any excuse to not. So a screen, he's going to always get caught on a screen. Yeah, he's dying right. on every screen, yeah. Right. If somebody moves him out of the way, if I can fall, right, that's – no one's that weak. Yeah. No player uh, on the, out here is that weak. Red Cocker asks in the chat, can you name a wizard that actually plays defense? And, yeah, there are a couple, but that should be to – I know what he's trying to say, that they're not – a ton of good defenders on this roster, but that should be even more to the point when pool stands out above and beyond as such a bad defender uh, on a team full of bad defenders, that that should be uh, hammering the point home. Even you more can't be the worst or the worst. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, over the last 10 ish games, since uh, pool has been back as a starter, he's shooting about 43% from the field, 32 and a half percent from three making all his free throws, although not taking many of them. Uh, he's around like five or six assists and like three ish turnovers. So not the greatest, but, but again, there's, there's been at least some more flashes. The problem is I've said this two or three times this year where I'll see two good games in a row and I'm like, yes, he's figuring it out. And then he will lay an absolute stinker in that third game. So just some amount of consistency, like I'd take slightly lower highs if we got, you know, a few lows that weren't quite as low. Um, so just, that's what I'd love to see from him more than anything next year is just like finding more of a sweet spot. Like, like Denny is kind of what Denny is and you're going to get 18 points, eight rebounds, a couple assists to steal a block on reasonable volume, you know, like every single night he plays and that's fine. Like, but you know what to expect from him. And, and, and the point about pool, it applies to Kuzma too. Like just, if you're the two high usage veteran guys, you just have to be a little more dependable, I think too. Yeah, but I, and I, I, I was the same way. I'm the same way. When I think he's trying to figure it out, he goes back to his his old ways. Right. But I haven't seen this guy. Yeah, that's right. I Hopefully haven't this seen is- this guy these last two these last two games. This mm-hmm. is a new guy to me. I haven't seen this guy as poised and solid, and and really looking for as many options as you can. Mm-hmm. So that's what makes me say, okay, there had to be some type of epiphany that happened. Somebody got to him. Something, something happened. Because I feel like he, he got it. Or he's getting it now. Mm-hmm. Because tell me if I'm wrong, have you seen this guy before? There's been a couple games where I've seen more of this, but I think like last night specifically, I I cringed a lot less at some of the shot selection. In the, in that Bucks game, he still had a couple no no yeses. Like there was one where he sort of like no looked Giannis from uh, the left wing, and he made it. You know, to his credit, I I think so. Some of the shots were still tough, but he made a few more of them in this Lakers game, especially though. The shot diet was like, oh okay. Uh, yeah, like that, that's what I want you doing next year. So I'm with you there. I agree. Uh, for, for anybody that didn't get to watch this game, we're obviously talking about pool having a better game. So just the stats behind it, he had 29 points of 10 of 19 shooting five of nine from three, he had five assists, two rebounds, two steals. So, uh, you know, more of that, let's just say more of that. And the other person I think who's been really good here. Uh, of the younger guys in the last couple of weeks has been uh, Jared Butler. We've gotten some like really good, you know, young guy performances from him against Milwaukee. He had a season high 17 points. Butler was seven of 10 from the field, three of three from three. He had three assists, three rebounds and two steals in only 18 minutes, uh, which was awesome. And then in this Lakers game, not as great uh, shooting the ball in nine points, but he also had a team high seven assists, three rebounds, three steals and one block. To me, he already offers you more defense than any of your other point guards, which I love to see, especially as like the change of pace guy off the bench. Uh, you know, this has been a pretty pro Jared Butler podcast since them picking him up. And 
Uh, I, I think that's making them look really good. I would have liked to see Jared Butler be the guy. Like, so they had him on a two-way contract and Eugene Amarui on a two-year contract or on a two-way contract, and they gave Amarui a two-year deal. I would have loved to see that two-year deal go to Butler because I think he's more a guy who could fit into your long-term plans as a cheaper guy, whereas there are kind of more Amaruis out there than there are Butlers. That was just sort of my take. But either way, I, I think Butler's earned himself a spot on the roster for next season. Yeah, I think it should went to Amarui, me up to Butler as well. I mean, mm-hmm. to me, Butler is a a coach's point guard. Yeah, right. You'd enjoy, yeah, enjoy having one of him on your team. Yeah, you need a coach. Every every team need a coach's point guard. Mm-hmm. When everything goes awry, when Poole goes, you know, out of out of sync, like he, like he can do. Uh, when Ty is maybe you know out the game or something's going on, and I need mm-hmm. the game back control of my team and of mm-hmm. my offense and and now I need to micromanage the offense right to get everything I, I want Butler out there mm-hmm. right I'm with you um so I agree with you that two way should have went to Butler because I don't I don't understand I'm Rui's upside there there really isn't any yeah, he's he's another Gill. He's younger Anthony Gill, like honestly. Yeah, but he's under he's undersized. Yeah, I agree. He's undersized, so he's undersized. He's way too small to be a big. Yeah, he just runs real and, hard. That's it. And work and way too uh, big man minded to be anything else. Yep. Yeah, he's a small if ball, a very small falling, ball five. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so like, I, you can't even name me a lot of those in the NBA. Because there's no mm-hmm. need for him. Yeah, it doesn't work. So, you know, I like nothing, nothing against him. I like his hustle. I like his physicalness. He did a good job when he was playing the head, guarding mm-hmm. Giannis those few times. Giannis couldn't do anything with him. Yeah. Which is, that's his specialty. That aggressive, aggressive like, uh, one through five defender, drawing fouls type of guy. But He's pretty mobile, yeah. Mobile, but, I mean, other than that, like, he really doesn't fit in any particular split space. He's also 27 years old. So the chances of him improving uh-huh. are, you know, if he were 22, I think this would be a slightly different conversation for me where I'd be willing to see like, okay, maybe there are a little more wing skills there, but uh, you know, I think we got a pretty good sense for, for who he's going to be. Uh, maybe he makes some incremental improvements, but again, that, that to me still, he maxes out as like the last guy on your bench. And I don't know why right, you yeah. needed to give you that know, guy a two year deal. You remind me of a modern day Anthony Mason guy, rest his soul, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know where that type of player fit in this modern game. That's true. Uh, in the and chat, Anthony Lock- Mason was more skilled than he is. Oh, yeah. And probably more athletic, too, I would say for sure. Um, Locked on law said the wizards love their tweeners. Yeah. I uh, can't argue with that. There's always one guy on the roster that you're like, uh, probably wouldn't be on a lot of other rosters in the league just because of his size. Uh, so harp asked us, uh, do we have the point guard of the future in Jordan pool on our roster here? And then one of the other questions we got, basically, um, it never makes no sense. Asked us, he said, it seems like Gill is a critical part of this team's vibe. Lack of explosion is the ultimate vet. Uh, they probably keep him. Um, but it's clear that Jared Butler deserves a roster spot. And he mentioned the signing of, of Gino uh, Amarui and how they have two more draft picks coming up. So it's like, how, how do you start to manage the end of the roster here with guys like this? Like you can't keep everybody of the Jared Butlers. Uh, do you bring Tyus back? And now you have three spots used up for point guards. Like, I guess are the, you got to start clearing some spots here for some of your young guys in this year's draft. So um, any thoughts on, on guys you would be maybe willing to move on from at this point? I mean, honestly, you, first of all, you got to do all you guys like you did Tristan, put them on mm-hmm. the floor. Yeah. Let's get a real evaluation sure. a real time. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what, what worse can we do? Yeah. I'm with um, you. Other than that, because I mean, at the end of the day, those are spots that's being unused right now. I mean, not you're not utilizing the, the kids that's on there, really, the yeah. players that's on there. So, mm-hmm. to me, if I'm gonna fill those spots, it's gonna be players that I can have utilization with. Yep. So let me 
say, all right, we keeping two. Whatever two we're going to keep, we're going to keep two. So let's go, you know, let's make sure we give them a platform. We can see them all and the best two win. Mm -hmm. And and still it's not safe. (laughs) Right, Right? exactly. Because if I can get something better. But, you know, you just, you don't want to just feel it because you can. You want to feel it with something to have some emphasis within the team. Somewhere it serves a purpose. Yeah, fills a void and also maybe has some upside. Those are the things I would be focused on. Yeah. Uh, no last in the chat. Are we saying they should dump Anthony Gill for Amarui? No, I'm just saying you, there's only so many spots you can afford to give to guys that will never be more than like 10th, 12th men. And the Wizards have a lot of 10th, 12th men. At some point, you got to start kind of thinning the herd a little bit here. I mean, what purpose are they going to serve? I mean, Bodies yeah, and practice. I mean, <laughs> yeah, like, we're not saying dump them, but yeah. we're saying replace them. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we get something better, we need to. Re- that's those are two that we, you know, this the reason they're playing because they're useful. Yeah. So we're not saying they're not useful. Sure. But they're useful in in situations when everybody's on on the injury reserve list, you know, mm-hmm. injury list. Right now they're useful. So yeah, they the, they they're the next best useful option, but they don't mean it's the best option we can have. Right. They're 10th, 12th men maxing out as 10th, 12th men. Yeah. You need your 10th, 12th men to be guys that have potential to be 7th, 8th, ninth men. And exactly. There's just not enough of that. Like, I, I don't know, it's probably a good enough time to, to throw this in here. I went to the Capital City Go-Go's playoff game the other night, and they played the Long Island Nets. And if you put the, probably the 10 most talented players in that game, I would say eight of them were on the Go-Go roster. Uh, but the two guys on the Nets in Jacob Gilliard, who's an undersized point guard, if he were three inches taller, he'd probably be a st- like a starting point guard somewhere in the league right now. Uh, and then uh, maybe like five inches taller. But uh, Keon Johnson, that was a first round draft. I think he went in the first round. Um, just crazy athlete who's finally learning how to shoot. And it's like, OK, both of these guys, the way they're playing, I could envision them being on an NBA bench somewhere and spotting in for for a team. Looking at the Wizards team, they had a lot of guys that are like the really good G League guys, but it probably doesn't ever translate to them producing on an NBA court. Like Jules Bernard in that game had almost a 20-point triple-double. The problem is he also almost had a 20-point quadruple-double with nine turnovers. So it was he needed a lot of like reps and shot attempts and a lot of usage, and he scores at the G League level, but no one's going to give him that ball enough to do that effectively at the NBA level. He's not super athletic. He's not a knockdown shooter, not a great ball handler. Like he's just kind of solid. And I think there's a lot of those kind of guys. You've got Hamadou Diallo, the top 1% athlete, but he's a six foot four power forward, basically who doesn't shoot. It's hard to translate. You've got RJ Hampton, crazy athletic, not really a point guard. Can't really shoot. There's just like a whole bunch of those dudes And to me, it's like the reason you have a G League team at this point is you should be filling it with as many possible guys who could maybe turn into real NBA players for you somewhere down the road. It's like, yeah, you had a good G League team, but what to do for you? Still lost in the first round of the G League playoffs anyway. And by the way, Jahadi, if you had seen the end of this game, it would break you. Because like as somebody who actually like played interior defense, there was literally none of that this entire game. Like, the final play of the game with one, uh, seven seconds left was Gilliard going the entire length of the floor at five foot seven and shooting a three foot floater untouched to win the game at the buzzer. And just like, is there nobody here that could slide over and just like dump truck this dude to the ground or something? Like it, it was, it was just such a heartbreaking way to lose a game, but that was the whole game for them was just giving up points at the rim over and over and over again. And uh, that's hard to see. So I don't know. It just it fits into the theme of like we got to start having some projects here with some bigger upside, and that doesn't seem to be something they're really focusing on too much here so far. I hate to say it, I really hate to say it, but if I'm gonna fill those rosters mm-hmm. and I can find an equal player, yeah, that has more versatility, mm-hmm. I might go overseas and get him. Yeah, I would be looking pretty hard at that. Because at least I know he'd be more of a team player. He'll come in and fill a role more easily. He'd come in, yep. Yep, come in and fill a role. 
it, he's he won't be uh, one dimensional. Mm-hmm. The, the only one from that game that I watched and I was like, okay, I could see this a little bit. And he's still probably another guy that's at best like a 10th man was Julian Champagny. And, and I, or excuse me, I keep saying Julian, it's the other one. We have Justin Champagny. Sorry, Justin. Uh, he, he did some things. Like he had a pretty good game. He let the game come to him. He kind of efficiently got himself to 20 points. And actually here the other night against the Lakers, he had 13 points, five of eight shooting, three of five from three, seven rebounds, two assists, one steal in 20 minutes. Like that's all you ever want from a guy like that. And he's also the mold of player that makes sense. He's six foot seven. He's a decent athlete. He could play up or down in the lineup a little bit. So you get some positional versatility. I'd be trying to find more of those types of guys. Uh, the, the guy I like the most on the go-go team is still John Butler Jr. He's basically a seven foot shooting guard who weighs 190 pounds. But uh, he weak side chop locks a little bit. He runs the floor really hard. He's got some touch. So he's like at least intriguing. And he, he may never turn into anything, you know, that can play at the NBA level. But there's there's something there that he could provide a unique skill set for. And to me, that's that's way more interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I got to uh, check him out. Yeah, he's he's at least he's unique. I would say he's, he's trying for the unicorn mold pretty hard. He's just way too thin right. still. Uh, Locked on Law mentioned Johnny Davis here, and I think it says a lot that we've been talking about the young guys on this roster, and it never occurred to me to mention Johnny Davis. Uh, like that, that experiment has just failed at this point, and I think for everybody, you just cut bait at the end of the season, whatever the cost yeah. is. That's just, it's not going to work out. Like we know that now. They're not even like, and, really and, he, and he had a shift. Yeah, yeah. They've given him some minutes here and yeah. done really nothing to stand out, uh, which is tough for him. Um, all right, let's shift gears here a little bit, just sort of backing it out. Uh, the Wizards as a whole, the move to Virginia, which I think we were both kind of not in favor of. Uh, me, selfishly, someone going to games, definitely didn't like that. Uh, it basically fell through. Uh, so th they've announced that uh, Monumental Sports has uh, reached a new agreement with the D.C. government. In the press conference last Wednesday, uh, Ted and Muriel Bowser, the mayor, said that uh, the Wizards would stay here through 2050. It's a $515 million package to renovate Capital One Arena and all of Gallery Place, among some other things. And that means the deal with Virginia is dead. So, I, you know, selfishly, I'm glad to see it. Although it was hilarious kind of seeing these quotes from Ted about like, home is where the heart is. And I realized that, you know, D.C. is just where we needed to be. It's like, nah, man, your deal fell through because uh, you aligned with some people who didn't think it out very well. But, oh, and I've had this change of heart and I just wanted to come home. Like, shut up, man. Like, just it's so disingenuous. And you just you either think we're stupid or you're like laughing in our face while you're saying it because everyone knows that that shit's not true. Oh, I mean. So I know. In, in the beginning, the entire Virginia play was yep. to get to get DC to put up some money, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't do it. Yep, not enough. At so least. the more that they seemed like they wouldn't do it, the Virginia, the, the Virginia situation became more of a reality. Yep, agreed. I still don't know why it was becoming a reality. It was something that he really wanted to do. Because at the end of the day. Them being able to build out a complex there was sort of what, like him owning all the real estate around yeah. him and stuff. Like yeah. that was the move, I think. Yeah, I think because that's where everything is going now. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, um, the stable center, mm -hmm. it's, no, it's an event space. Yeah. That's Chase just, Center, the same a, way. Arena with, with a big event space around where you can do restaurants, mm -hmm. you know, all type of things, right? Um, yeah. I think Dallas, Mark Cuban did that to, I think I still, is it still at, um, American Airlines Arena? I can't even keep track anymore. Yeah, I think whatever it was, he I, did I that to so. that, right? Yeah. Um, even like football, you have uh, LA. Um, the new Rams uh, as an Amway. I forgot what the new one's called. Into it, though. Yeah, no, yeah, into that's, it. That's, what the, that's the Lake, that's the uh, Clippers, right? And two is what the Clippers is going to be in a big event space. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, where outside of it, so many things around there. Mm -hmm. So, and what now is a big real estate move. Yeah. 
So it's not just about the, the team. It's a big real estate play. Mm-hmm. And any owner will want to have that real estate play because it's, it's so much. Another, now. another revenue stream and, and yeah, your money helps you make revenue. other money. Yeah. Right. So now, you know, they're putting money into this. And to me, it's not a lot of money. I mean, once you, if you, you say 500 mil. Uh, yeah, 515 just for the renovations to Capital One and surrounding just galleries. For the renovations, right? Yeah. And they're talking about event space to, 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 help to fix the event space around too, right? All that 515 is going for that entire project, right? I think so, yeah. Well, I mean, in the real big scheme of things, that's not a lot. Yeah, I think it's probably less all in than they would have gotten out of Virginia although they would have been building the arena for scratch. So I think that was like a two, like a $1.2 billion thing or whatever. So. Yeah. Right. So that's not a lot when you think about what the plans and, and I'm sure what plans in his mind he was going for. Sure. That's taking a big. Yeah, he settled you know, for sure. Yeah. That's, that's a big settlement. Yeah. So, you know, did he get what he wanted? No, you know, did we? Did the fans get what they wanted? You know, I don't even. I mean, they would be happy for renovations, sure. but even if they didn't get them, they'd be fine. Yeah, wouldn't have bothered me. I don't have any problem yeah. with Capital One Arena. I've been to a decent amount amount of NBA arenas. I don't. I think it's in the middle. It's not of the bad. List. Yeah, it's still not bad. You no, know, it's older, but it's not for an older arena. It still feels like it's it's very competitive with the newer ones. Mm-hmm. I think so. Although I was just in the Nets arena last week, and the thing I'll say, they went like a little smaller, it felt like. Uh, I think it's like 17,000 as opposed to like whatever, 20, 21 or whatever Capital One maxes out at. And uh, I'm exactly six feet tall, and when I sit in the seats at Capital One Arena, I've got to tilt my legs just like a little bit, you know, just to fit around the cup holders. Right. I had like a solid four or five inches of extra knee room uh, in the Nets arena. Uh, it was beautiful. I mean, we were camped out for the whole day for the first round of the NCAA tournament. I was just comfortable. I was more like, it was just a little bit more comfortable and that went a long way. So yeah. I don't know. Maybe I that's part of the renovation. Consider, consider comfort now. Yeah, you know? they should. <laughs> got to. I mean, you got to, because a lot of people can't fit in that arena. Some it's, it's certain arenas I won't go to because I'm like, just be too comfortable <laughs> sit down the whole time. Even if I, I'm like, I got, first of all, I get a guy, I got to get a corner seat. Yeah. We got to be in the so aisle. That's almost right? impossible. There's too yep. many things you want to you have to do. So, yep. you know, so, yeah, when they consider comfort, that's really good. And most of those new arenas, that that's part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, I don't know. It's sad that the whole thing had to play out this way. It's clearly a money play. And I get it. Like, it's a business. It's Ted's right to do that with his business. You know, at the end of the day, I'm happy that they're staying. It does sort of just like. Uh, there's like a little bit of bad taste still. I think it'll go away, you know, especially if if these renovations help them. Um, the other thing about going to that go-go game the other night, when they built the the um, the entertainment and sports arena where the Mystics and the go-go play and the Wizards currently practice, it's just, candidly, it's not in the greatest part of D.C. over in, in, in Southeast. So they had a really strong police presence the first couple of years. On every corner, he saw a cop car, multiple security guards. Even though it was just a couple blocks away, there was a shuttle that took you to and from the parking lot there. And uh, now only saw, uh, actually, I don't think I saw a single cop car the whole time. Two security guards that were sitting in their car. They don't run the shuttle anymore. And the walk from the parking lot back to the arena, half of the streetlights were, were burned out. So... It, I'm like I'm I'm a grown man at 7 p.m. in in D.C. Like I didn't feel that unsafe, but it it if you're trying to build that, like it just seemed like they've punted on that that building because of this whole plan. They were going to move the teams out of there. They don't want that to be the practice facility long term after D.C. put 65 million dollars into it or whatever. So now that they're going to stay there, and it looks like the Mystics will probably stay there, I'd like to see them kind of go back to like putting a little more energy into that facility because. It's a fun product. Go-Go games are cheap. And the real sell is you can have your family cheaply go see a professional basketball game. Like, you could take a family of five all in for 50 bucks for tickets. Like, that's that's half a seat at a Wizards game. So, right. um, but if you don't feel safe, you're not going to do that. So, it, it's they're really kind of like killing their own product there by not sort of putting that 
those resources back into it. Well, they, they're going to have to now. I mean, I wonder how. So definitely, he had to now sign a deal to be there for another however many years. Sure. For that, for the, for this, for the government to even say, okay, we're going to put this money up. Yep. Right. I agree. So now, you know, it's all about what his long term plans are. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and with the long term plans, okay, well, you know, uh, just here in St. Louis, when um, when we had the St. Louis Rams mm-hmm. and Stan Crockett, owner of uh, the the Nuggets and the Avalanche and some mm-hmm. team, some soccer team, big soccer team over the seas and whatever the the um, so the hockey team is, right in mm-hmm. Colorado. Yeah. Um, I guess it average, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. He waited out 10 years to move that team. But <laughs> in those yeah. 10 years, the service started going down. Yeah, uh, why put money into it if you know Yeah, why easy. everything just started deteriorating slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah. And so I'm just hoping. And then after that, he's like, all right, now I'm moving. Mm-hmm. Got 10 years, I had my plan. I'm moving to L.A., Making it, we got, got, we put it around the forum next to the forum, and then we're gonna build a Disney World around it, pretty much, right? Mm-hmm. And so he didn't. He was like, "I'm not taking this money and putting anything into this facility, anything into other than everything to just to make it pretty much generate income itself." Yeah, and just hopefully that's not the case. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, if you're, if, if you're gonna be Capital One through 2050. So you can't put, you probably can't bring the Mystics back over. So they've got to still play there. And he seems to care enough about the Mystics. So hopefully this was just sort of like part of the, the, the bargaining strategy here, maybe of like, all right, I'm going to pull support for some of these things. And maybe the city's doing that too. But to me, like, if you're not going to use that, if that facility doesn't become your practice facility anymore, and the whole point, and Ted made this big thing about like, oh, we put it in Southeast and the go-go and the mystics will help bring like economic revitalization to that neighborhood. They've done nothing to build up the surrounding area in any way, shape or form, like literally nothing other than their little like walled off campus. So to me, if you're not going to get any value from that, like pick them up and move them to Baltimore or something, you know, put them somewhere where it's still far enough away that like maybe it would help you kind of stretch out your fan base a little bit more to the Baltimore basketball fans that don't give a shit about the wizards. No one's going to see them like if they play the same nights as the Wizards. Like I missed a Wizards game the other night in in real time because I went to go see the go-go. It's sort of counterproductive if you're going to try to build up that product. So I don't know. I just like to see. How is the fan base for the Mystics and the go-go? For the go-go, it's non-existent. It was me and 100 of my closest friends watching the game there. And I think half of them related to players on both teams. So not great. Uh, the Mystics get a good crowd. Actually, I think they could probably benefit from a slightly bigger building, but over the course of the season, like I I went to a couple games last year and it was like Sue Bird's last game or whatever that she would play in DC. That was like the one sellout I went to. So come playoffs, I think, you know, if you could move them back to Capital One Arena for the playoffs, it'd be like a different story, but I don't think it kills them that much in the regular season. What's the capacity of the the facility? I think like 5,000 something around that uh but they were literally telling you you have to sit in these three sections right behind the benches because that's across from where the camera feed is yeah we don't want them to see you know we want them to see as many people here as possible because they don't care if the rest of the arena is not you know if it's empty because not on tv uh but i i just think just doing something to throw throw 10 of the g league games up in up in baltimore or something you know like get a little more kind of regional vibe to it uh than just putting them in a DC facility that you're not going to kind of reinforce. So something to think about, Ted, I'm sure he cares a lot about my opinion on this kind of stuff. Uh, I think that's really all I got for you. Jahai, anything you want to talk about before we roll out of here? No, I'm good. I'm good. All right, folks. Well, uh, Denny. Denny. Yeah. Renegotiate. Yeah, right. Exactly. Renegotiate after this season. Yep. 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 I'd be talking about the extension here already. Uh, to your point, for the last couple months, he's been averaging basically like 18, 9, and 4 on 60% shoot, shooting, a true shooting, uh, and just solid every night. 
I don't think the defense has been quite as good. I got to throw that one thing in there. So Denny fans get mad at me. Got to check a box for them and meet my quota. Uh, but yeah, he's, I think he's been the best player on the team for the last month and a half, at least. And on that 11, $12 million to your point, shit, how do you do better than that? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the drawing board. At least I'm trying to. Yeah, right. Exactly. Have my agent call every day. Yep. And every good game. If, not, yeah. if you're not calling, if you don't have any leverage, you get a new agent. Yep. I'm with We're going to work a leverage play somehow to get me back to the drawing board. At least got to get my guy a better parking spot or something. A couple more yeah. perks here for, for moving yeah. up the pecking order. Yeah, yeah, that's a good call. All right, everybody. Uh, glad to be back here. We'll get these rolling more regularly here, and uh, we'll see just kind of how they finish up, and then we'll start talking draft and uh, next season and all that kind of good stuff, roster building. So uh, if you got topics you want us to you know cover the kind of the slow part of the year here, let us know and we'll make sure to cover them for you guys. But as always, this was Bet uh, Believe in Wizards. We're brought to you by Bet Online. Rate, review, subscribe, and we will catch you all next time.